there's a crocodile with a clock in its stomach chasing you and it could easily turn you into a tyrant it can turn you into a tyrant or a cowering victim or a hero those are the options fundamentally so and that's the gorgon looking at her own the medusa looking at her own reflection you know mother nature with the head full of snakes you know a terrifying vision and that's actually to some degree an archetype that men get confused with women and you know that's the witchy part of women and that's the part that's attractive 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 but rejecting 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 and so many men are petrified by women they won't approach them at all they have no idea how to talk to them they're just petrified into immobility and that's way more common than you think and so that breeds resentment like you wouldn't believe you know you know it's then that's the problem too if you're chronically rejected by people it's often because of your own insufficiencies you know whether that's cowardice or lack of social skills or whatever it is it's like you can't just brush it off as oh well you know no one likes me but really I'm okay it's like no no wrong if everyone rejects you there's probably something wrong and it's probably deep and difficult and it's gonna be horrible to fix and so it's this isn't a trivial problem it's not a trivial problem at all and so you know that's mother nature for men too because from from the sexual selection point of view if they if they're not selected as a mate nature has taken them out of the game right and so you know people don't really like that they're not that happy with that and so but getting all whiny about it and then getting violent is like that's just not all not really very helpful although it's very common so this is Lynn Isabel an evolutionary arms race between early snakes and mammals triggered the development of improved vision and large brain in primates a radical new theory suggests these are old representations I really like this one this is a, I don't remember I think it's Greek but it doesn't exactly look Greek it might be older it doesn't matter anyways you see it's the same thing same ideas as, as Graham's dream right it's like there's this thing that exists this this multi-headed snake and it's got this infinity problem it's everywhere that's that little circle down there and the problem is well what do you do with it you cut off one head seven more grow that's the eternal problem of life and the problem is there 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 is the category of problems in life and it ain't going anywhere and so the question is can you deal with the whole category at the same time that's the thing that's how to be in the world is to deal with that category all at the same time and so how did how did human beings what did they come up with as a solution and that's so cool too because the solution they come up with not only was the heroism that allows you to approach what you're terrified by and what you find offensive and to learn from it but also the idea of sacrifice and, and that was played out by cultures everywhere including human sacrifice and you think what the hell was up with those crazy bastards so long ago they were sacrificing to gods all the time what kind of clueless behavior was that burn something and please God burn something valuable and please God it's like what was with them what were they thinking well they weren't stupid those people if they were stupid we wouldn't be here they were not stupid and believe me they lived under a lot harsher conditions than we do so those were some tough people man you know back then you'd last about 15 minutes and so you don't want to be thinking of your ancestors as stupid like there's no real evidence that we're much different cognitively than we were 150,000 years ago so anyways sacrifice what does that mean sacrifice well it's a discovery man it's the discovery of the future it's like the future is actually the place where th there is threat and it's always going to be there so what do you do you make sacrifices in the present so that the future is better right everyone does that that's what you're doing right now that's what you're doing here that's what your parents are doing when they pay money to send you to university they think you can bargain with reality it's amazing you can bargain with reality you can forestall gratification now and it'll pay off at a, at a place and time that doesn't even exist yet it's like who would have believed that it's like that's a miracle that that occurs and it's not like people just figured that out overnight how are we going to come up with an idea like that well it's like well we thought about it for seven million years and uh, you know we got to the point where we could kind of act it out but we didn't know what we were doing but it was a it emerged like a dream it was so the terror of the future is a dream and the solution to the terror the dream of the terror of the future is another dream and and it, it comes out in mythology and in fantasy and in drama 
where you act out the sacrifice. And then it's a step on the way to full understanding. So we can say sacrifice now instead of doing it, you know, although we still do it. It's just not concretized like it used to be. We do it abstractly. And we all have faith that it will work. You know, and we also set up our society so that it'll work. And one thing about, you know, I'm not a fan of moral relativism for a variety of reasons, partly because I think it's an, it's an extreme form of cowardice. But anyways, apart from that, no, 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 no. There's minimal ways that you can set up a society that will work. And so one of them is, is that the society has to be set up so that your sacrifices will pay off or you won't work and then the society will die. And so it has to make promises. People have to make promises to one another. And that's what money is. Money is a promise that your sacrifice will pay off in the future. That's what money is. And so if the society is stable, you can store up your work right now. You can sacrifice your impulses and you can work and you can store up credit for the future. And then you can make the future a better place. But society has to be stable enough to allow for that. Hyperinflation will do you in. So the promise that's implicit in the currency is the promise that what you're doing now will pay off in the future. And if people don't have that promise, then, well, we know what they do. Because in, in gangs, for example, in, say, gangs in North America, the time horizon of the gang members shrinks rapidly because they don't really expect to be alive much past 21. And so they get really impulsive and violent. And like, why the hell not? That's, that's what you do when, when the future doesn't matter, when it's not real. You, you default back to living in the moment and you take what you can get right now. And no wonder, because you don't know if you're going to be around in a, in a year. And you get whatever you can, well, you can bloody well get it. And that's like anarchy, that state. And so you don't want to live in, some people like to live in that state because they're really wired for that, you know. And so they're, they're much more comfortable in those conditions. They're, they're kind of like warrior types, I would say, in some sense. But, you know, for most people, that's just... Well, that stress will just do you in, you know, the stress of a life like that, so. That's a pretty horrible picture, the one on the right, I think. And, you know, it's, it's a creepy picture. And uh, don't you think? It seems like a creepy picture to me. Yeah, and so that's Quetzalcoatl, if I remember correctly, who was an, who was an Aztec uh, dragon god. Uh, and that's the Eye of Horus, by, by the way, this little thing here. And, um, that, see, the Egyptians, they worshipped the eye. Yeah, well, that's cool, because, it, well, why did they worship the eye? Well, wake the hell up and look at the world. That's your salvation to do that. Pay bloody attention, especially to the things you don't want to pay attention to. And use your vision. Have some vision. And you can use your vision to see into the future. And that is your, that's your redemption. And the Egyptians, they didn't know how to say that. But they knew how to represent it. And that's how they represented it. Like, the pupil on that is completely open, completely dilated. And that's a god as far as the Egyptians were concerned. It's Horus, and I'll tell you Horus' story at some point. So, early primates developed a better eye for color, detail, and movement, and the ability to see in three dimensions. Traits that are important for detecting threats at close range. Humans are descended from these same primates. <coughs> All right. So, now, the initiation. Well, when you go into psychotherapy, or when you make any supreme moral effort, which is roughly the same thing, you have to confront that which you do not know. Now, I mentioned the pre-cosmogonic chaos and the idea that at the end of Jung's life, he sort of thought of the unconscious and the world as the same. And you think, what the hell does that mean? But here's what it means. So let's say you're in a long-term intimate relationship and you get betrayed. Okay, so... What is it that you see when you see your partner at the moment you know of the betrayal? Well, you see the pre-cosmogonic chaos, and here's why. Well, it rattles your unconscious up because you don't know anything anymore. You don't know what the past was, right? You don't know what it was, and it's supposed to be real, and all of a sudden you don't know what it was. And so you come up with wild ideas about what it might have been, and what it represented, and then you don't know what the future is going to be anymore. So then your fantasy fills that space, and you don't know who the hell you're looking at, that's for sure, and you don't know much about human beings, and you certainly don't know anything about yourself. And so all of a sudden, not only is everything in chaos inside your mind, but everything is in chaos in your world. And it actually is, and there's no telling the difference between those two things. You know, and so then 
may, you're just sh shattered. And so then you go talk to a therapist for like two years and you think, what happened? What was the reality? And the reality is, because who knows what the reality was like, but as far as you're concerned, the reality is, I better represent this properly in my head. I better figure out who I was, who that person was, what we did together and what it meant because I do not want this to happen again. And so you're healed when you get to the point where you've grasped the bloody moral of the story. What went wrong? And how can I not have that happen again? Because that's the purpose of learning, right? That's the purpose of memory. It's to prepare you for the future. And so you have to pull out of that massive chaos a functional representation that increases your wisdom so that you're not this naive target the next time you enter into a relationship. So at least you can have another relationship without being so traumatized that, you know, you, you're done. And you know, it can take people years to talk that through because this landscape of potential opens up when, when they're betrayed. It's like, well, anything could have been the truth. Well, you, to sort through that, you have to wander through all that mess. And it's really painful and, and emotional as well. You have to sort through all that mess to come out with the new you, right? The renewed you.